Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> The Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. To become a member, go to rmef.org. And the podcast is also brought to you by OnX Maps. And with OnX Maps, you can know where you stand with the most accurate hunting GPS tech on the market with land ownership maps that work offline. Go to onxmaps.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 20% when you sign up for an app membership at onxmaps.com. The podcast is also brought to you by Gerber. Uh, go to gerbergear.com and learn about the knives, the vital, the big game vital, the Gator Premium, all the things that we use when we're out in the woods and not just knives, but also some really cool multi-tools that they have. We're also proud to partner with Sitka Gear. And if you go to sitkagear.com, you'll see their full line of clothing. And their tagline is turning clothing into gear. And they are doing that through advanced technology that allows you to stay in the field longer, hunt harder, and stay safer. The Elk Talk podcast is also brought to you by GoHunt.com. Uh, go to GoHunt.com and sign up for the Insider. Um, the, the insider is changing how haunts and hunting information are found. No doubt about that. Use promo code ELKTALK, and when you do, when you sign up for the insider, you're going to get $50 of store credit, mad money, in their gear shop. And we are also brought to you by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is the original designer and inventor of the pallet plate diaphragm that's completely changed the way elk calls are made and used. And to find out more and to order your elk calls, go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or BuglingBull.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 15% on all of your elk calls and elk call accessories. And with that, Corey... We are ready to get into it. Let's jump into it. So, Corey, last week when we were talking, I told you this story about my deer hunt that became a wolf hunt. And well, you, you didn't actually tell me the story. Really? <laughs> you said you no. You said you had a story about it. Oh, and, uh, oh you made oh, me wait oh. until now, so I haven't even heard <clears throat> the story. So, I'm hearing it at the same time as everybody else. So on this podcast, do we want to just talk wolf hunting stories? Do we want to talk wolf hunting politics? Do we want to talk about Colorado introduce get, having a ballot initiative about introducing wolves? What what do we want to cover? Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Well, let's start <laughs> out with something that hopefully is a little more uh, more inclined to put a smile on the face and not raise the blood pressure. Okay. That would be elk or wolf hunting stories, because I, I believe you have a story from last year, don't you? We've got all sorts of stories. A wolf hunting story? Yeah. All right. So I can start with mine. Okay. I, I went out the other day, and it was my birthday. My wife said, you know, you've been filming for 12 years. Every day you go hunting, you have cameras with you. You should go by yourself. And that should be your treat for your birthday is to go hunting without cameras. 
<laughs> and I'm thinking, ah, that, I like that idea. So I go down, buy a doe tag, and I got my buck tag. I'd already filled my elk tag earlier in the season. So go down to this spot that I always hunt, and uh, it's all public except there's two little pieces of private land. One is a 160-acre piece where that guy, he lets me and if you're hunting bears or wolves or anything his outfitter might not be hunting, he's like, yeah, knock yourself out. The neighbor has about 80 acres, and I don't know him. <clears throat> so anyhow, I'm walking across a corner of his property there, going from one section of public or through, across his little corner over to the next section of public. And I look over, and I see this coyote. I'm like, hmm, that coyote has a really strange color to him. <laughs> uh, and uh, I look through my binoculars. I'm thinking, man, it looks like a big coyote, but yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm here for deer. Well, then this, what in my mind is a coyote, walks by a fence post. <laughs> and I now I have some relative perspective that its back is higher than the second strand of barbed wire. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's why that coyote looks so funny. The color is not a coyote color, and it's way too big to be a coyote. You know, it turns out to be a wolf. It crosses right at right at the time I recognize that it's a wolf. It crosses from this property I have permission on to the neighbor where I don't have permission. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, there you go, Randy. Every time we've wolf hunted and we've, uh, we've got a shot, I've always had a guest with me. So I've never, in all the time here in Montana, since we've been able to hunt them since 2013, I've never taken a shot at a wolf. I've always had guests. And I'm thinking to myself, there you go. That was your one chance, and you screwed it up. Because the wolf just kept walking into the timber across this other guy's property. I shimmy over to my left, going south, and I get behind this little rock ledge. And I thought, well, what do you do now? Um, I don't know, Randy. Uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> so so how, far away was, how far away was the wolf when you saw it? At, when I first saw it, he's about 500 yards. Gotcha. And uh, I, I couldn't. But and it was actually walking away from me. I think it had seen me. So even to back up further, as I'm walking up the mountain, there's this buck doing his business with his doe right on the skyline. And I'm watching, thinking, well, the rut definitely is on. And the doe just stands there. And when the guy's done with his business, he walks off and the doe keeps looking down in this little draw where this wolf ends up being. And she let me, I, I mean, there's no doubt that doe saw me. She looked over at me a couple times, but she kept looking at where this wolf was. So it should have registered in my head that there's probably something over the hill there where this doe is at. But it didn't. So <laughs> I was I was unprepared, let's put it that way. So I move over to my left. I get behind this little rock pile, and I'm thinking, well, I don't know what to do uh, other than lone wolves are usually looking for mates. You know, December, January, we're starting to get into the mating season. Yeah, it's early, mid-November. but And growing up in northern Minnesota, where I did, we had wolves. They, they never were gone from that part of the country. And I used to go to the river down. I lived just on the hill above the river. I used to walk down to the river, and I'd howl across the river some days when I was just bored in the wintertime to see if I could get a wolf to respond. And occasionally they'd respond, and I, it got to be kind of a, I don't know, a, a way to break the boredom in a town of 500 people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we knew we couldn't, couldn't hunt them and we'd occasionally catch them in our coyote and fox traps but you had to release them which is another story but anyhow i'm i'm thinking back to my youthful days of howling for wolves so i lay down get everything ready and i let out a howl and i'm thinking to myself randy 
that was a really, really bad howl. Why did you not bring your Rocky Mountain hunting call wolf <laughs> howler with you? Um, Cause you're deer hunting. The answer to that is because I did not. Yeah. I should have brought, you know, some, a deer call, not a, a wolf call, but I kind of think about it. All right, Randy, that, that first one was really bad. Kind of like my, usually my first bugle of the season is something we don't want recorded. <laughs> they get better from that point on. <clears throat> so I, I take a deep breath. I'm like, all right, I really got to make this one last a long time. Just drag it out and sound so lonely. So I do that. And, uh, I look and hear this wolf comes running out of the timber on the dead run, right? Uh, I mean, exactly on a line towards me and it shoots underneath the fence. So now it's on property where I have permission and I get ready. I range in every little bush out there and it went down in this little draw and it comes up out at this little cluster of just stunted little fir trees with some rocks and grass by it. And I'd range those at two, depending on which tree it was, between 280 and 295. So I set my dial to 300 and I'm thinking, all right. And I get on my, I'm laying with my pack right down in front of me. It's an absolute, almost bench rest type situation. And I pull the trigger and I hear click. <laughs> I, I got so excited, I forgot to put a shell in the chamber. <laughs> oh, I, you talk about amateur hour. So, fortunately, no one is there other than me. And with this habit I have of filming everything, all I could think to do is when I first set up there, I put my cell phone off to my right and st- click the video button because I thought, well, if nothing else, it'll be interesting to record my reaction when I screw this opportunity up. (laughs) So a few adult words later, and I have a live round in the chamber. And when I come back to the scope, now the wolf is gone. I'm like, oh, no, Randy, (laughs) you've done everything in your power to mess this up. And uh, I kind of scan with the move the scope a little left. And there it is. It's sitting there almost on its haunches looking for me as if I heard a wolf over there. Where is he? And fortunately for me, the time of day was just right after the sun had come up and I was coming from the east. So the wolf is looking into the sun trying to find me. And all I remember is when the crosshairs got on the chest of the wolf instinct must have taken over because i don't even remember consciously pulling the trigger or anything (laughs) and uh when i look back after the recoil i get right back on the scope and i just see this ball of fur laying there i'm like you got to be kidding me right this didn't happen after the hundreds of days or miles or whatever measurement you want to use of me intentionally hunting for wolves i'm going to shoot one as just an ancillary part of a deer hunt? No way. <laughs> without a so, camera there. <laughs> without a camera. Oh, and then uh. I turn to to I, I turn around as if the camera guys are there because I'm so trained that as quick as this happens, if we're gonna capture the emotion and the rawness of it, you have to turn to the camera immediately. And I turn and there's nobody there. But <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'm out here jabbering to myself, doing handstands and flips and cartwheels, and I don't have anyone to share it with. Yeah. So I looked at my cell phone and said something I'm sure pretty stupid. I haven't even looked at the video on it yet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I walked up there, and there's this great big old female wolf, beautiful, big, gray-silver-colored wolf right yeah. there where I shot. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I took her into, in, I don't, in Mon- uh, Idaho, do you have to check them in you do. when you shoot one? Yeah, I think uh, yeah. within 24 hours or something. Yeah, it, it's the same thing here. Or maybe you have so to I, report it by I, phone within 24 hours and you have to check it in within 48 or something. But yeah, there's mandatory reporting by phone and then mandatory check in in person. Yeah. 
that pretty similar to what we have here and so instantly i'm taking pictures doing all i can i'm yeah I, you know the one event in your life that you want to capture i don't have a camera guy there i don't have anyone to take pictures i didn't even bring a tripod <laughs> so i'm kind of mickey mouse in my pack as a tripod and using the time remote on my camera and then on my cell phone it's like ah uh, randy but you know the old saying that if you give a monkey a camera and they figure out how to take a thousand pictures, at least one of them will turn out. Yeah. Consider me to be the monkey with a thousand pictures. Well, I I got your text that morning after you shot it, and I'll tell you that picture was it turned out. So I don't know how you took that one or what camera it was with, yeah. but that was a good picture. Yeah, that was with my cell phone. Nice. But uh, like I said, that it, I had to sort through the other 999 junky <laughs> ones to find one that turned out. <laughs> but so here's the crazy part. One time we shot a wolf on the show. And uh, side note, if you want to have a, a lot of people, I mean thousands of people, send you death wishes, broadcast on cable tv a two-part series where you shoot a wolf (laughs) (laughs) and you're gonna have an awful lot of people pretty wound up about things uh so uh but uh, when we shot that first one we were gonna eat it and the biologist talked me out of it scary uh, you know you can't cook those diseases out of there here's the list of diseases blah 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 all right so we didn't eat the the one we shot on the show but i always said if i shoot another one i'm gonna quarter it i'm gonna pack the meat out and we're gonna eat it so i spent the rest of that morning skinning it and boning it quartering it and i hauled out uh one one front quarter was gone because of the shot but I hauled out the other front quarter, the back straps, and both hind quarters. And here at my office in Bozeman, we're going to have a, a wolf barbecue someday. And we told people, you know, we'll let you know. And they all said, ah, I might come and watch, but uh, I'll make sure and eat before I show up. Uh, so, yeah, I I, I, I I hear a pause on your end as if you <laughs> you think I've lost my mind. You know, I I fully support eating what you shoot, uh, but I also support <laughs> fully predator management and, and doing our part in managing all of the animals. And somewhere in those two strong supports, there's a disconnect because I would never eat a wolf. <laughs> I just, you know, I think uh, between, and I don't know, you know, there's all the, I, it's hard because you have to wade through the opinions when it comes to wolves on both sides, you know, there's, there's the fanatics oh, about yeah. kill them all. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I am, yeah. I wish they had never shown back up here. I wish, you know, we could get rid of them, all of that, but we can't, the reality is we can't. So there's no point, you know, right. sitting there saying, shoot, shovel, shut up or kill all of them or poison them. Cause it's just, it makes us look unintelligent. Right. But you know, there, there's, there are diseases they carry. There are some of yep. that. And I think, you know, for the most part, you look at, I've eaten cougar, I've eaten bear, really not a whole yep. lot different in the fact that they eat other meat, they carry the same kind of bugs and everything, but there's just something nasty about a dog. That I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I, I don't think I could cook it for six hours and <clears throat> burn it to just a piece of charcoal and still eat it and be comfortable with it. That's a pretty much, I'd say, 80% of the people are re- reflect your comments. <laughs> uh, and uh, some have asked me, why do you want to eat it? And I, I've had to think about that. Well, I've, let me say this. I've had years to think about why would I want to eat one. One is just, if you want to call it the adventurous palate, yeah. uh, to see what it tastes like. Um, and the other part of it is, I, I would say most of the reason is I just want to see what it tastes like and see if it's palatable and edible. 
that's the biggest reason. And then the other part is, you know, it, when I trap, when I hunt, or when I fish, if something is salvageable, I try to salvage it. Now, I'll admit, I used to do a ton of trapping and I didn't eat them. You know, you can only eat so many beaver. <laughs> I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat a raccoon. Raccoons are, they're, they're as skanky and foul as anything. See, and I think they're um, probably higher so, on the list than a coyote and a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, anyhow, I'll, uh, if, if I die of some canine distemper or something, you'll be the solo host of the Elf Talk <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, it, speaking of, of wolves and being nasty, when I shot that one two years ago, they have a distinct odor. And, you know, mm-hmm. I think coyotes have an odor, everything. Wolves have a, it's a different odor. It's very distinct. But I have actually smelled that odor out and, you know, out hunting elk in the fall before and just not connected what it was mm-hmm. until I shot one. And there have been times now since yeah. that... I smell wolf and realize that we're, we're close to wolves or there've been wolves there recently. Yeah. It's, it is very distinct. And the one we shot on the show, my buddy, Matt, uh, he, he got the shot and he made a great shot. That was the most foul smelling animal I have ever walked up to in my life. It, it reeked so bad. And so I expected that when I walked up to this one, I just shot and it did not smell like that at all. Huh. Uh, it, there, there were no odor to it, really, to speak I was going to say, you, um, you make that so, comment right on the heels of saying you're going to eat it. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the I, listeners I are probably been. drawing that connection that Randy is not making the most intelligent decision right here. Well, that that just goes as part of my standard <laughs> operating procedure. <laughs> they know that by now. The other part is, you know, I, I mentioned I grew up in northern Minnesota, and I did a lot of trapping. Uh, I was, I, I was probably one of the most flush, cash flush, high schoolers you ever met because of my trapping escapades. And if you trap enough coyotes and, and fox in northern Minnesota you're going to have some incidental catches of wolves. A lot of times they would just, they're such big and powerful animals. You take a little one and a half coil spring that you're using for a a red fox. And this wolf just puts his teeth down in there and he springs, you know, he pulls the springs and you'd walk up there and here'd be your trap just laying there in a bunch of pieces. Uh, But occasionally you'd get there before they did that or you used a number two double coil and uh, you'd retain them. You'd just catch them by the end of the toes and they wouldn't pull very hard. And you'd, you'd go get the game warden and they'd call the U S fish and wildlife service or whoever, and, and they'd release them. But none of those wolves back there, did I ever remember the foul smell of some of the wolves I've smelled out here? And I don't know if that's just the time of year, if that's, Okay, they they eat on a a white-tailed deer. They eat back there. They devour it right away and move on. Whereas out here, you know, it takes them two or three days to eat an elk, and it's pretty rank by the third day, and that's why they're stinking so bad. But if if you want to test the strength of your stomach, walk up to a wolf that has been eating a rancid old <laughs> elk carcass. Yeah. I, and I don't know it's yeah. you know the meat even smells so I don't I don't know what what it is but I know when I skinned mine all right you know the carcass itself didn't smell palatable so I, think, I mean I, I was well, going to we'll say it'll out. be uh I'm sure there'll be video cameras rolling and I'm uh, I'm interested <laughs> you piqued my interest. <laughs> uh, well, you know, as much as we have wolves here in southwest Montana, around Yellowstone Park, and pretty much throughout the western, uh, central and western half of the state, we are what I would say lightly populated compared to you folks in northern Idaho. Yeah, and you know, 
you people are the, the epicenter of the wolf yeah, population. And I would say, you know, that includes central Idaho probably as really the epicenter. And, you know, they've spread north from here, south from Canada. And but yeah, everything basically from, I would say, Interstate 84, which runs through Boise, everything north of there. Uh, is heavily populated. And I think Northern Idaho, the, the reason it's becoming, well, it, it's been heavily populated, but it's just so thick up there. It's it's really hard to hunt wolves outside of trapping them. And so I think that the wolves are able to flourish there. There's, you know, it's easier for them to hunt elk in that thick stuff. It's uh, harder for us to hunt wolves. And you get down here, you know, anywhere from Boise up to about the Salmon River, it's a lot more open country. And it's a little easier to hunt wolves. You can get out in the winter and hear them and see them from a thousand yards away and get shots at them a lot more readily. Up north, your shooting lanes are 12 to 40 yards, and unless you catch them out in a clear cut. So. <laughs> Hunting them with buckshot. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. Well, you you shot one two years ago. Wasn't yeah, it? shot one two years ago, and and we uh, you know we we made it kind of a point to hunt them and it really up till that point i'd been out with them you know i'd i'd hunted them a little bit here and there just one day here and then you know i'd go another day a month later and never really focused efforts on it and realized at that point a how incredibly intelligent they are b how incredibly difficult they are to hunt just as a matter of finding them and, and staying on them, they move so much in that time of the year, you know, when there's snow on the ground, it really, it makes travel difficult. And if you do find them, you, you really, it's hard to keep up with them. They're just machines in that snow. And then the other thing that we learned was how devastating they are to bull elk in the winter. And that really fueled my desire to, to hunt them and to do more to manage wolves because they are so hard to hunt and they are so hard on bull elk in the winter that you know, I think it's it's our responsibility as stewards of the of the game to put in time managing. You know, we, we shoot elk and elk seasons are set in a way that hopefully sustains that elk population. And that's that's the whole yeah. reason for hunting. Hunting is management. And like it or not, you know, nature doesn't, it's not able to manage itself anymore because we've encroached on nature. We've interfered with it. And to say, hey, let's go back to letting nature manage nature. It just, it, it's not a viable way to manage populations of, yeah. of game anymore. So we hunt elk to keep things in check. And now you throw this this apex predator right into the mix. and it throws things so far out of balance that it can't, it can't, it really can't recover because elk don't have the same habitat they had before. They don't have the same winter grounds they had before. They don't have the same travel corridors, all these things. And now you throw a predator in the middle of it that can just absolutely annihilate them at will. And we've got a problem on our hands. And so there is a threat, you know, I won't, I'm not going to go out and say our elk, hunting seasons are going to be turned off completely because of the wolves. But I think there's a lot of factors there at play that can definitely threaten our elk hunting seasons. And once that goes, you know, we we are already seeing limited numbers of elk in certain areas. And I'll use the low, low up in uh, North central Idaho, the low, low drainage was, it, it was just ripe for a disaster. And I think it was the winter of 96 that was really hard up there. Well, wolves were reintroduced in 1995. And then we have this winter hit that took out, and I don't remember percentages or numbers, but I will say it was devastating to the elk herds up there that winter. At about the same time, Mm -hmm. they have an overpopulation of bear. You know, about that time is when they started allowing you to shoot two bears up there because the bears were out of control. And now you throw wolves in the mix, and those elk in you know, whatever were 20, wow, almost 30 years, you know, 20, whatever it is, you can do the math, but from 1996 till today, the elk have not recovered from that winter kill. And there's, you know, this is on the heels of fishing game, going out in helicopters and shooting entire packs of wolves from a helicopter because it's the only viable way to hunt them up there. 
and the elk still can't rebound uh, because we just can't keep up with the wolves. And so it's, there are some, some concerns, logistic, you know, like real concerns, legitimate concerns here. And yep. we've, we've got to, we've got to do our part. And so that kind of fueled me to say, uh, I've got to be more proactive in hunting wolves. I've got to make it a priority. I make elk hunting a priority every year. I need to schedule some time to go and hunt wolves. And so that's a long lead in into my hunt two years ago. Uh, but we did. We hunted them for eight days. Uh, during that time, we found, I believe, six winter kill bulls, of which four of them were very mature bull elk. Uh, in, in an area that I know really well, the elk were not weak. They were not run down. They were targeted by the wolves because those bulls stay up higher. They're in an area where the wolves have a, an advantage on them because of the deeper snow. The bulls are in smaller groups, mm -hmm. you know, two to six bulls were in these, in these bachelor groups. And we ended up seeing 11 elk, 11 bull elk in that drainage. And we found six of them dead that winter in a, in that eight day period. So seeing that and recognizing the, the devastation they have, especially on bulls and seeing our bull to cow ratios continue to, to decline, um, you know, I won't go as far as to say they're wiping out numbers of elk statewide. There are areas where the elk herds are, are healthy as far as population goes, but a lot of those elk are now on private lands where they're safer from the wolves, where there's more human interaction during the times of year when... Uh, when we really can't get to the wolf or the wolves can't get to the elk down there. And when we aren't able to hunt them because of that. And, uh, it's, it's, we've got a little bit of a mess to navigate here for a few years. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on the whole idea that we, you know, the wolves were reintroduced in 95 in Montana, Idaho and Wyoming. And it, <clears throat> Just a little history for people who might be wondering how it unfolded is if you lived here like we did, you realized that you were you were going to be dealing with wolves. It, it was going to happen. So how did you try to manage or negotiate the best possible path forward knowing that wolves are going to be part of the landscape? So the states worked really hard to try have criteria about when we would get the chance to manage them. Uh, what would the populations have to be? How many breeding pairs? Da, da, da. How, uh, when would this happen? And what was the mechanism by which we would get state management authority? So it, it was as imperfect as that solution is, it really was the only option we had was to negotiate and try to get the best deal possible. And so the biologist said, you know, by 2000, 2001, you should meet this, what they called delisting criteria of 100 wolves in each of the three states plus 10 breeding pairs in each of the three states for three consecutive years. And almost I like clockwork. 2001 that was met and we start the process of getting the state's management authority that ended up being litigated until 2011 so 10 years of court fighting to get that uh changed and then even after that uh it took a uh, your one of your congressmen uh congressman mike simpson uh, and one of the Montana senators, Senator John Tester, to attach a rider called the Simpson Tester Rider. They attached it to a, a spending bill, and that's what got us state management authority in Idaho and Montana. Unfortunately, Wyoming got left out of that due to some stupid politics that I still shake my head at. But <laughs> now Wyoming, Wyoming does have management authority. But we look at that, and Montana has, uh, the, we've said, you know what, you can start hunting these wolves in archery season, and you can hunt them, I think our season closes March 1st or March 15th, so we've got the better part of six months of wolf hunting. We can take five wolves a year, and 
it's like you said, it is a lot of work, but we fought so hard to get this management authority or options, whatever you want to call it. I feel that I got to be out there with tags in my pocket, doing what I can when the opportunity arises. And for many years, when I have the time, I'm like you, we go out and we specifically hunt wolves in December, January, and February. And I've come to the same conclusion you have, Corey, that they are super, super smart, elusive animals. They are hard to hunt. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just to give you an example, we, we took trail cameras with us. And when we'd find a dead elk, we would leave the trail camera on it just to see, are the wolves coming back? And most of the elk that we're finding, these wolves had absolutely devoured everything they were breaking the femur in half and eating the marrow out of the bones of the femur. I mean, it was there was a pile of hair there and a couple big chunks of bones that hadn't been mashed down into into nothing. And so I thought, you know, if it was a fresh elk, I think we could probably safely assume they're going to come back and keep eating the meat. But I just wanted to see, you know, do they come back? Do they come back and chew on the hide? And almost without any exception... Every trail camera we placed on these dead elk, the wolves would come back to it. Oh, really? And in three in three of the cases, we, we saw the wolves on day one. So there was a, a pack of eight of them. We saw them on day one at about a mile away. We thought we were going to strap on snowshoes and go catch up to them. And three hours later, we weren't even a half mile from where we had initially seen them and realized <laughs> that was not an effective <laughs> method for hunting. Um but we didn't see the wolves again until day eight when I shot the wolf. We caught back up to him. Uh, but in three of those cases, I put a trail camera on the elk carcass. And within two hours, three times, the wolves were on the trail camera. So it's almost like they were following wow. us. And every time we stopped at a kill and checked it out and left, the wolves came to see what we were up to. And, you know, they were right there. They were... They were somewhere close by. We couldn't see them. We howled. We never did hear them howl in those eight days until I shot mine. And they started howling, trying to regroup there. Uh, but yeah, just we were on fresh tracks every day and could not catch up to them. We never saw them, never heard them howl. The day I shot mine, we found a, a dead elk. It was out in a meadow. We sat up on a ridge and had a nice little perch there and just thought, They've been coming back to all these other trail cameras. I think, you know, they might come back to this one. There wasn't hardly anything left to eat on it, but we thought it was worth a try. We sat there from daylight until I think I shot it at about 11 o'clock. And when we went down and followed the tracks, they had been bedded 200 yards below us on the hillside all morning. <laughs> oh, man. And when they finally huh. went across the meadow, I'm fairly certain our wind had switched and they smelled us and they got up and just were sneaking across the meadow. They weren't going to the elk carcass. They were actually about 200 yards from it going from left to right instead of going out to the to where the elk carcass was. And I really think they had just smelled us and got up and were moving out across the meadow to go someplace else and get away from us. And we just happened. I got up to stretch and warm my feet up and looked down and there's a wolf standing down at the bottom of the hill and... A funny story about videoing, we had literally five video cameras with us. We didn't have a dedicated camera guy, but Tyler Crockett and I both uh, both had big, full video cameras. I had a, a GoPro. We had another small one. We had all these cameras set up from our little perch to video everything. And after I shot mine, the wolf dropped. I went back to the camera. None of the five cameras were on. <laughs> yeah and i had reached over and turned on oh. both of mine tyler had reached up and turned on his he had a a memory card error mine i must have hit the record button twice and on the other one i it wasn't powered on quick enough i'd powered it on and immediately hit record and the record didn't catch so we had <laughs> eight days worth of wolf hunting footage had five video cameras are with us and we didn't get the the kill on video so oh man <laughs> well uh, i shouldn't laugh at that the, <laughs> the part that just strikes me is just how as you're explaining that how many days and how many miles you put on before you had yeah. an encounter and 
that's been the same for us, which is why if somebody is out specifically hunting wolves and they're filling multiple tags each year, they have my respect to the highest yeah. degree. They are putting in effort. They've got major skill, major determination. And I I would encourage anyone who wants a challenge, come to Montana, Idaho, or Wyoming and decide you're going to go and specifically hunt wolves and go do it in yep. the mountains. You're, you're, you're going to maybe, I mean, occasionally you luck out. Like it, where we hunt them, there's a bunch of wintering areas on private ground and some state wildlife areas. And those wolves, I would say, make a 30 to 40 mile loop over the course of about five days. And so you're hoping that in the days that you are there, they come through in the daylight or they're, they're bedded or they're hanging out there during hunting hours. So many times you keep doing this and keep doing this and you see fresh tracks in the morning and guess what? They came through last night and now they're going further on their loop. And so you go out, you kind of know where their loops are. So you go further ahead and hope you can intercept them. But the amount of miles that you put on wolf hunting yeah. is crazy. Yep. And that, like you said, or maybe I'm just that bad. Well, they, they just, they don't quit moving. They're continually hunting. And that was one of the cool things that I did. You know, I learned a ton just in that first year, uh, just by happenstance, you know, I, I knew nothing about wolf hunting, just, uh, the howling. We learned a lot about that. Uh, we learned about how they respond, how they, you know, when we shot that one, they literally circled around us and started howling, trying to regroup. And you could hear the howls getting closer and closer. And then they sat on a ridge a half mile out and howled and howled and howled, trying to find that other wolf. And they finally realized, hey, it's not coming. And they turned and howled their way up out of the canyon. Uh, But one of the things that was really neat was watching how they hunted. And we saw them that first day. We watched them hunt a hillside and they would just spread out and they, their, their legs are so long. They cover so much country as they run, but they're just trotting on this hillside and they're zigging and zagging and crossing each other's tracks. And there's eight of them just spread out on this hillside doing that. They're literally combing a hillside and they would find an elk track and they would turn and line out single file and just start trotting on that elk track. And we also noticed that wow. they send out one, two, three scouts And those scouts are covering country. We'd find them one day, there'd be two fresh tracks. And 12 miles later, the next day, we would cut those two fresh tracks again. And we just kept doing that and realized these two animals are just covering every single drainage and canyon in this entire area looking for fresh elk tracks. And then they find the fresh elk tracks, they go back and howl, and the rest of the pack comes, and the pack gets on them, and they start hunting them until they kill one. And, uh, you know, so a lot of times like this fall, I found one or two tracks and realized this is the scout, you know, out looking for food. And it's pretty interesting to, to start realizing how they, how they behave. And it actually helped us last year. We got in on wolves several times last year. And, uh, a lot of it was just that just covering country, trying to find those tracks. And we just follow those tracks till they get into the pack. And sometimes you're lucky and you you're into the pack immediately, but I would hate to try to focus on hunting those scouts because they're covering so much country every day. I think the pack, you know, has got a little bit more of a home territory and it doesn't roam as much until they find elk, but it's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it, it's impressive. And, you know, I, I, some people absolutely hate wolves. Some people love them and think that they're the next salvation (laughs) of planet earth and you know for me having spent years now hunting them and i don't know how many miles and days and having modest success uh i think about how they're in a lot of respects the wolves are just that was they're, they're a wolf that they're to hate them or to love them or to treat them and you know think of them as some sort of satan or savior i, I can't relate to that uh they they've certainly yeah. earned my respect as a hunter um and i think like when i walked up to this one i shot 
well, just recently, you walk up there and you look at how big these teeth are. And you're looking to see, you, I, I always look at the teeth of everything just to get it a, you know, get a feel for the age and all that. But I think what I want to run over there and try to tackle a big old bull elk with nothing but my teeth. No. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't sound like a real high uh, risk reward proposition, but you know that, that's it's either yeah. that or starve to death for them, or or a deer, or whatever they find. Um, there's a group of wolves in Montana. Did I ever tell you the story about when I watched the wolves uh, no. catch the antelope? Oh, so in the Madison Valley, south of Annis, there's a lot of antelope that winter there. And we're down there uh, wolf hunting, and unfortunately, the guest hunter I had that day, who shall remain nameless, uh, uh, <laughs> shot right over the back of a wolf. Um, <laughs> no, it was the day before. <clears throat> and then we're sitting there, and we watched these three wolves come out of this irrigation ditch. And I hadn't seen them, but I was watching this group of antelope, and all of a sudden, they antelope usually feed in a dispersed manner. Well, all of a sudden, they all huddled up in a group, and there's probably 60 or 70 of them in this herd. And one of the wolves comes out of the irrigation ditch and starts trotting along behind them. The other two wolves just lay down. I, I, I'm sure I'm given human characteristics here that are not deserved, but it almost was like, Hey Joe, it's your turn to go catch dinner. Uh, we'll be here when you get done. Uh, and in, in this part of Montana, just about every section, every square mile has a perimeter fence around it. And so this wolf is just trotting along behind these antelope and they're doing this big circle around this, one square mile pasture and I, I don't have permission to hunt there otherwise i'd have been over there doing my best to to help out but uh we watched that and after about the second lap around this big pasture the antelope had this uh, response of you know what we're tired of this let's get under this fence and antelope don't run up to a fence and spread across and all find their own little path to go under. They bunch up and they go single file one after another. And as quick as those antelope got up to the fence and got all bunched up, that wolf put the burners on and he went flying into that herd of antelope and he had one of them so fast. It was ridiculous. And he drug it out of the herd and the rest of them just did their single file thing. And the other two wolves that had been laying there trot over there as if to say, Hey, Joel, you're getting pretty good at this. You know, we might give you a passing grade today. And, uh, I, I'd often wondered, or I'd, I'd blame the coyotes for all the antelope carcasses I would see down there. My mind now no. thinks that some of those are wolf kills. I, I, I could not believe how it, uh, and maybe, Maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but it was almost as if these wolves had figured out that if you can get an antelope in a pasture and just get them on the run, sooner or later they'll tire of running, and when they bunch up by the fence, that's your opportunity. Because this guy looked like he'd done that before. And, uh, I mean, he had that antelope so quick. Uh, it was just amazing. Yeah. And, again, no video cameras. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that would have been an amazing piece of footage to capture, even though it was, I was watching it from probably two miles away or through my spotting scope. Yeah, probably two miles away. But so I watch them and I think about how impressive they are as a hunter, how lethal they are as a hunter. And I have a hard time hating them because, you know, they're a wolf. We're the ones who put them here, we're the ones who have created the political landscape where they get treated as a deity almost in some cases and then villainized in others and they're just yep. doing what they do <laughs> you know it's they, they i don't think they said oh can could you guys come and release us here and <laughs> put us in the political crosshairs i i doubt that the wolves <laughs> had to say one way or the other at that but uh so for me i take those instances and i will tell people, you know, I, I understand your frustration. I'm there with you. I was 
ridiculously frustrated, so frustrated in that 10 years of litigation. But I, I try to encourage people that the best way to channel that is to do what you mentioned earlier. Go buy your wolf tags. Make sure you have your wolf tags with you when you're out elk hunting or deer hunting. And even after those seasons are closed, spend some time out in the woods. Or, you know, if you know somebody who traps, do something to help them so that the these trappers are in Montana anyhow. Two out of every three wolves yeah. that we take are taken by trappers. I don't know how it is in Idaho, but I don't know the stats, but yeah, I know it's definitely the most efficient and effective way. And that's something we learn. You know, we spend eight days running all over to get one opportunity at a wolf. And there's some trappers that know what they're doing and they're very effective. And I think in Idaho and and again I'm I've never gotten to the point where I needed to know exactly how many wolves I can shoot in a year. I'm, I'm still working on getting one a year right now, but uh, you can buy, I believe, five uh, wolf hunting tags and you can buy five wolf trapping tags. So you can have a total of 10 wolf tags. Wow. And I believe, and again, this is, I'm, I'm saying this, so check into it before you actually go and do it. But I believe if you are hunting in an area where there's a hunting season open at the same time as a trapping season, you can use a trapping tag to shoot a wolf or you can use a hunting tag to trap a wolf. So you can mix and mingle there and you could potentially mm. shoot or trap 10 wolves uh with those 10 tags yeah and i i was doing some research i think there's even a couple of your units up there in central north central where there's even some special management stuff to encourage taking even more wolves for the guys who are or gals who are really good at it that i for some reason i thought that you there's a couple units that you could get even more than 10 but i i suspect the number of people who get 10 wolves in a year yeah. you and i could count on yep. one hand and and most of them are trapping <laughs> i would say all of them are trapping shooting that many yeah but yeah and, and there's like you yeah. said yeah it's like any conservation topic um you know if you aren't able to go out and taller elk calves if you aren't able to go out and plant habitat in elk country you know volunteering for the rocky mountain elk foundation or something at the very least send in 35 dollars and support their efforts to do that you know if, if it's you know whatever the excuse is or the reason is that you can't go out and put boots on the ground to to help with this conservation find an organization that does and there there are wolf organizations you know in idaho there's a there's an organization called the foundation for wildlife management which i'm a member of and the great thing about them is they actually reimburse wolf hunters for expenses incurred while wolf hunting if they fill a wolf tag and it's up to i think a thousand dollars or maybe even mm -hmm. more that they pay out um and, and just through their organization i think it's almost 600 wolves and they've paid out like almost $400,000 uh, to hunters to reimburse them for the cost they incur while hunting wolves and so that, you know, gas receipts, things like that. And so, you know, they're, they're putting, they're putting efforts back in yeah. to encourage people to go out and do that. And in Idaho, I think a wolf tag is the least expensive tag you can purchase as a non-resident. It's 31 bucks as a resident. It's like 11 or $13, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, you had mentioned if you're hunting elk or deer or anything else during a time of year when the seasons are open, have a wolf tag in your pocket. Because I think incidental is probably a, a higher method of kill than actually going out and focusing on it. And so you just never know when you're going to yep. see one. And it would be pretty, yeah. it'd be kind of a shame to have no wolf tag in your pocket and have that wolf there at 200 yards looking at you. No. Oh, man. That would be. <clears throat> yeah you know in montana we have a salvage uh law that says if you find a car killed or a vehicle collision moose deer elk antelope you call this number and go online whatever and you keep it last year we're driving to utah we leave bozeman about five in the morning we get south of Annas, and there is this humongous big male white just snow white wolf on the shoulder of the road and he'd just been run over i it wasn't he still didn't even have a rigor mortis or anything 
And I stop. I'm thinking, all right, I'm <laughs> glad we got this salvage law in Montana. Come to find out it doesn't apply to wolves. So we call Game and Fish and say, hey, you know, what do you want us to do with this thing? And they said, oh, give us the coordinates. So we did, and we hid it in the brush over there on the side, off the side of the road. But I think we need that salvage. Yeah, that's, that's all we, that's all we need is you going out and getting salvage wolves to eat off the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. i'll start the new what do they call it the roadkill cafe uh, but in wyoming you know under their management strategy there's a part of northwest wyoming where wolves are treated as a big game animal and you got to have a tag and all that i think there's even quotas up there and then a big portion of the state is what they call the predator zone, where wolves are treated almost like coyotes, and you can shoot one without a tag. I think then if you do shoot one in that predator zone, you go uh, and you check it in, kind of like you do in Montana and Idaho. Yeah. I was checking those rules out because last week we were down in central Wyoming helping my Uncle Larry fill his elk tag, and I thought, well, this is the predator zone. If I see a wolf, I'm going to grab that rifle, Larry. And uh, <laughs> we'll have a small interruption yep. to our elk hunt. <laughs> Didn't see any wolves. So one of the things you mentioned earlier, Corey, and this kind of gets me to the whole Colorado debacle about to happen here, is it looks like Colorado has received enough signatures that the wolf reintroduction uh, ballot initiative will be on the ballot next year in 2020 uh, on election day and uh, uh i don't know if anybody who listens to this podcast is a favor of what we call ballot box biology um i would prefer to let the professionals do the wildlife management but you <clears throat> you talked about how it's not like it was 500 years ago and how elk have if you look at their historic range versus the range they occupy today, for a large part of them, they are on the marginal bounds of their historical habitat. Because human society development, we've developed most of the valleys, most of the foothills, the country where they used to winter. Um, we've disrupted migration corridors with reservoirs and highways and trains and cities and other stuff. So this idea that somehow there's this big happy family out there of elk and wolves that, oh, we're all going to get along and everything's going to be in balance until 330 million Americans pack up and leave this country, head back to wherever their ancestors came from. And restore the landscape to its original place. The idea that we have some, uh, you know, the the balance of Mother Nature, that's a complete crock. It just it's not going to happen as long as we yep. have disrupted landscapes like we do today. Which means you can't have one piece of the equation, an apex predator out there, not being managed. And we look at, because of the just the dynamics of how Washington and Oregon, yep. you know, they have the I-5 corridor there, I think it is, where those folks, they don't have to live with wolves like the folks in eastern Washington or eastern Oregon. And the likelihood of those people agreeing to any type of wolf management uh, plan, like Montana and Idaho and Wyoming have, is very slim. Uh, I I feel bad for the Oregon and Washington hunters and, and their wildlife because without having the political courage or political stomach, whatever you want to call it, or common sense to manage wolves, just like you do every other species, their hands are tied. And it's got to be frustrating for them. And I look at if this passes in Colorado, uh, and given the uh, spectrum of how urban Colorado has become, I think a lot of people feel there's a very high likelihood now that it's on the ballot, it will pass. And what options will Colorado folks have to manage wolves 
if they hit the landscape there. Yeah, it's just, you know, and and I'll make a prediction right now. If it passes in Colorado, you will see limited opportunity for non-resident elk hunters in the state of Colorado within three to five years. And right now, Colorado yeah. is about the only state that you can just go and buy an elk tag as a non-resident and go hunt. You know, I mean, as far as yeah. there's no restriction, they don't, they, they welcome anybody, anytime, no limits. And if yeah. wolves hit there, they will have no choice in managing their elk herds, but to limit that number because it won't be able to sustain that pressure. And it already, I mean, you could argue that Colorado is the most heavily pressured state when it comes to elk hunting. And it would be hard to argue against that. But their elk herds really overall don't suffer because of that. It's frustrating right. to go there and, you know, you have to deal with the, the challenges that come from hunting with a whole bunch of other people. But the elk are okay. You throw wolves in that mix and mm-hmm. the elk will not be okay. And they won't be able to sustain right. that kind of hunting <clears throat> pressure anymore. And so there's that side of the equation that now you look at the revenue that comes into the state of Colorado through hunting. That's going to be you know, decreased, the state is going to be on the hook to manage their own wolf population, which that's a big part of, of some we haven't talked about. When these wolves were forced upon yeah. the states, the states had to get control of them because they weren't going to get any money. I mean, they, that, that's the, the hard part is now there's another animal here, license and tag sales to hunt that animal are minimal, but the cost to meet the requirements that come from managing so they don't end up listed on the Endangered Species Act again is astronomical. And so it just it's not a yeah. it's not a business plan that any state is going to look at and say this is a good idea for us. There's just so many so many <laughs> negatives that come from it. And like you had mentioned, you yeah. know, the people who are putting it on the ballot and pushing to get it on the ballot, the people who are going to vote it when it gets on the ballot are not the ones who are truly affected by it. And you talked about Oregon and Washington and, you know, their, their whole state is basically governed by just a very small geographical area on the left coast that, you know, is one that's making the plans, making the rules and everybody else has to abide by it, but it's not, it's not smart for anybody. No, I I just look at the geography of Colorado yep. from Fort Collins all the way down the the face there, the Front Range through Denver to Colorado Springs to Trinidad. That all at one time was elk habitat. It was probably some of the greatest elk habitat in America. We, we have taken, we've disrupted what the natural patterns of those herds were. And we've done our best to restore and protect winter range, all the other things, and brought those numbers back up in Colorado. But to think you can throw gray wolves in there with zero management, no opportunity to adjust or to harvest or control their numbers, if you think that somehow that landscape is disrupted as it is by human development in these days, that that is still the natural cycle that, and that somehow there's this natural cycle that's going to keep everything in balance, you're smoking crack. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. So, I, and as someone who hunts Colorado, it's very worrisome for me to see this for so many reasons. One, it's a huge step to, towards more of this ballot box biology which completely gets rid of the North American model we have of how we manage species, how we use science, how, how the processes work. Once again, the process for recovering endangered species, if, if there's a lesson to be learned from the Northern Rockies reintroduction, it is that the process we use under the Endangered Species Act and the way that the courts can be used to litigate that process is broken. And I've told multiple people that I am a big fan of all species. I want not a single species 
to disappear from the landscape while I'm around. That said, there is not enough love or money to ever get me and most of the people I know in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming to ever again agree to introduce a species, I'm not saying wolves, but any species, under the current structure of the Endangered Species Act and all the power being given to the litigators. Because once the wolves get on the ground in Colorado, it's not as if the wolves say, hey, guess what? They're litigating in this co- in th- this whole idea in court, so we should quit breeding. Yeah. They keep breeding and breeding and breeding and breeding and breeding and breeding. And pretty soon, for those who are in favor of large numbers of wolves and this fantasy concept of happily ever after, that's exactly what they want. Let's get them on the ground and let's litigate and mission accomplished. Totally. Yeah. For those who say, you know what? We believe in this process of managing all species, of uh, you know, taking into account the human consequences of the marginal habitats, the disrupted landscape, and how we have to handle that. Those of us who look at it through that lens, we're we're at a disadvantage under the way the current legal structure of this operates. Yep. No, and it, I, wish, I wish I could say it. No, and, and it's really, it's, it's sad. And you mentioned it exactly how it happened here in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming. We had to have 10 breeding pairs and 100 wolves, documented wolves in each state in order for... For three consecutive yeah, and years. And they said they would agree to let the states manage them through hunting and other things once that was met. Because of litigation, yep. and this these numbers are so... You know, the state is the one who's in charge of documenting the wolves. They have to spend their money, yeah. their budget on this at a time when the wolves are still in litigation, when we can't hunt them and, and create any stream of revenue from them. We've got to manage the and document them. So there are well over a thousand documented wolves in Idaho, and I forget how many breeding pairs but well over 10x the the minimum number that was agreed upon to allow us to manage them. And it's still tied up in court and people are still, you know, suing the states and the federal government over the whole thing, not allowing them to be managed by the states, not allowing them to be hunted. So it's like, you know, you get, you get a little leak out of a dam and you can manage the loss of water that's coming out of that. But once that crack gets bigger and bigger and the water starts gushing out, you just you can't go up there and put your thumb on it anymore and hold it back, and it continues to just gush out. And that's really what we've got. We can't get on top of the wolf populations in these states, and we never will be able to through hunting and trapping because they're just they're so prolific at breeding. They're so prolific at getting away from from our attempts at hunting them that we look at the the number of wolves harvested in the state of Idaho. And from the time, you know, 2011 or whatever, when it first opened, I think it was 2011, then it shut down for a year and then it opened back up in 13, something along those lines. The number of wolves harvested each year is gradually decreasing. And the population of wolves is not decreasing. And they're just getting smarter. It's getting harder and harder to hunt them. Uh, We've just, we've opened a, a floodgate here that, we can't go back on and if colorado opens that with their landscape you know political landscape as well as their habitat landscape and the the elk populations the terrain that they have wolves are going to wreak havoc in the state of colorado at a at a rate uh, that's not going to be repairable yeah yeah it's it is just not a good outcome for colorado or, or for elk and deer in Colorado. Yep. And there's, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, it's it's just part of the natural process, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, and I hate to keep hammering on this, but we are not living in a natural world. This is not 1492 when Columbus landed. You know, this the landscape just is it. When you have elk, and all the studies show that 
large healthy populations of elk with great habitat can sustain predation way better than those herds that are on disrupted or marginal habitats. The amplified effect of predation in herds of any species where their habitat is compromised is much greater than herds that don't have disrupted habitat. There is really no place in Colorado that does not have disrupted elk habitat. And so the amplification of predation is going to be significant, probably more so than anyone's yep. projecting. It's just... But you, here's an interesting thing. I don't know if this will come up in the discussion or, uh, you know, if it does pass, uh, I'm going to be sending my money to litigate anytime I can, anytime I can contribute to the cause to litigate against this reintroduction, I'm going to donate. But, uh, you know, to the South in Arizona and New Mexico, they have been working on the Mexican gray wolf, a much smaller wolf. Uh, that's primary diet is mostly deer, uh, and other smaller uh, animals and less elk. But <clears throat> there is research out there that says if the reintroduction of wolves happens in Colorado, those gray wolves will quickly be in New Mexico and Arizona. It's not like oh, they absolutely. have on it. They, they don't have Onyx maps <laughs> and say, oh, oh, this is where I'm supposed to stay. Um, and if they did have it, they would get there quicker. Yeah. <laughs> but so you, you think about the, the consequence that has for deer and elk in Arizona and, and New Mexico. But it, how strange would it be if one of the litigation tools was the, the models that show if gray wolves get introduced in Colorado – and they move to this area where they're trying to do the Mexican wolf recovery. The models, the, oh, and I talked to the biologists and the scientists, they say, you know, there's this concept called genetic swamping, where the largest animals come in genetically, in a short number of generations, which in the wolf world, the generation is about three years, um, the larger species will genetically take over the less dominant species. So how funny would it be if the proponents in favor of wolf reintroduction in Colorado had to somehow hold off because they got sued over the consequences wolf, this ballot box idea in Colorado would have on this natural process in Arizona and New Mexico? Yeah. I don't yep. know if that would hold up, but if somebody has a chunk of money and wants to litigate that idea, I, I'm in on, I, I'll, <laughs> I don't know what the attorneys will cost, but I'll buy a couple hours of their time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just look what, at the, the effect that wolves have had on coyotes. You know, wolves mm -hmm. do not tolerate another dog in their territory. Mm, no. Uh -huh. And I mean, they kill pets, they kill hounds, they kill coyotes. They just, they will not tolerate another dog in their territory. These wolves in Colorado make it down into Arizona and New Mexico. It's not like they're going to co-mingle with these Mexican gray wolves. They're going to kill them, and they will kill them to extinction. And, yeah, you know, it's not to mention the fact. It, it'll be gonna, interesting with, to see how that plays out. I'm I'm thankful that the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is there. To the extent you can mobilize your your volunteers, uh, they've been doing that. In Colorado, the the hard part is the nonprofit groups. You can only engage in politics to a certain degree by function of the tax law. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is the solution and how do you how do you fight something when you know that your opinion is probably in the minority. You know that you're going to have to bear most of the cost and most of the consequences of the outcome. So, it, you know, it's kind of like spending the other guy's money. Uh, you know, people, they're more than happy to spend the other guy's money. Oh, they reintroducing these wolves doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. I'm, I'm struggling with how do you combat that? Yeah. I, I, I don't know, but, uh, 
hopefully waking uh, or, or bringing this topic to the, the surface here in our discussion of wolves gets hunters, whether you're a resident or a non-resident, thinking about it, thinking about what it will do to elk hunting in Colorado, but also elk hunting in Arizona and New Mexico and Utah and, and other surrounding states. And just, uh, you know, it, it furthers us down this path that we're going to manage wildlife at the ballot box. And that is a path that is terminal in the long run. Yep. Yeah. It's just, you know, and, and I, one of the things that people a lot of times will ask me whether, you know, even some within our own ranks, mostly people who don't understand the, the wolf issue, you know, from out of state or not closely connected to it, they'll say, why, why do hunters get so worked up about a wolf killing an elk? but it's okay for hunters to go out and do it. And my argument always comes down to, you know, we as hunters get worked up when somebody goes out and poaches an elk because they're not managed, they're not regulated. And wolves are the same. They don't care about tomorrow. They don't think about, okay, there's 10 elk out here in the field. I've got to eat for the next 10 weeks. I need to conserve these elk and make sure I've got, you know, one a week. They're going to go out there and kill all 10 of them if they can. And they don't think about yeah. tomorrow. They don't. They don't. They aren't regulated. They aren't managed on how many elk they can kill. And it's it's obvious in the landscapes where they're thick, the elk populations hurt. And that's really the difference. Is like you said, we aren't here to make wolves out to be the absolute end all villain. But they aren't managed, and we are concerned about managing elk. We are concerned about conserving elk. We are concerned about whether or not there are going to be elk here in five years, in 10 years, in 100 years, and wolves are not. And if we don't take that management into our hands the way that it's been, and we don't have that control over it, we don't have control over the outcome of, of elk populations and conservation moving forward. And that's the scary part of it. And so we have to have yeah. very strict control on wolves. And that control starts with right now in Colorado, if they're introduced, we've lost control. We've given up that control. We've given up yeah. management. We've given up uh, a portion of our hand in conservation long-term for elk and deer. And that's scary because we know where it can lead to. Um, we know the agendas that are behind a lot of this. And those agendas, whether their their actual purpose is to shut down hunting or not, they certainly are not going to back away from the fact that Hey, if the wolves are there, we don't need hunters managing elk. Let nature manage nature. And they're just caught up in that fairy tale that it just, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> dang. I hate to create such a depressing picture here, but it it's the reality that, and, and you living in Idaho, me living in Montana, we've lived up. Yeah. For me, it is as Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again. Yeah. And it would be different if the process could be trusted. But, the, you know, uh, technically, Canis lupus, uh, the gray wolf, is a canine. I tell people he's really a bovine. The wolf is a bovine, a cash cow. That's That's really what the wolf represents to a lot of these groups. They are a money raising machine and uh, it gives them lots of money and a lot of political pull. And that, that's really the leverage or, or what the wolf represents to some of those organizations oh, yeah. that are promoting this. They, uh, yeah, <laughs> I just, I hate to see it going down this path because it's in our rear view mirror, we can see where this is going we we've you know we've read that story before we've lived it and uh so part of my job that i've tasked myself with is to figure out how can a guy like me in montana help this cause in colorado i haven't come to the solution yet but i i don't want to just you know get on facebook and rant and rave yeah. about it I want to figure out how do you inform people? How do you engage people? How do you tell them, look, 
I'm here to share my experience and how hard it was to get control, manage state management control. And even when you get state management control, here's how difficult it is to actually manage this species. And if I remember right, I think Colorado banned trapping on public lands. I, I don't think you can trap on public land in Colorado. Wow. So they got rid of their spring bear hunt. So bears are big predators of, of deer and elk cow, deer uh, elk calves and, and deer fawn. If you are not allowed to trap them, how are you going to manage these wolves once they hit the landscape in Colorado? Yep. I, I, I'm struggling it, to it, figure I that out. I don't think there is an answer. Yeah. So... <laughs> Oh, is that what we set out to do in this podcast? I'm sorry if I let us down a path that seems like some I, point of no I return, tell you, I wish you were enjoying the conversation a lot more when you were talking about seeing a wolf at 280 yards and shooting it and seeing a ball of fur laying there and talking about you barbecuing <laughs> it into a chunk of charcoal and eating it to see if it's palatable. I think... Uh, the rest of the discussion has been yeah. somewhat depressing. And that's, you know, that's the hard part is we just feel like our hands are tied and there's not anything we can do. All these nonprofit organizations yeah. that are putting money behind it, getting it on ballots and everything, all it's doing is making them richer. An emotional response that they can send out to their members and dig into their pockets. And they're, they're sitting yeah. there getting their way and they know the path to, to be able to get their way. For us, it's almost a helpless feeling that we don't, don't know what to do to fight it so i would say if you're in colorado or yeah, if you hunt yeah. colorado i would uh i'd be getting involved any way you can yes. you know i know there are some counties it seems like in colorado that have passed um resolutions um that basically would oppose the wolf reintroduction in those counties and so um Find out in your county, send, send letters. Yeah. I mean, this is a political issue. And so you've, you've got to get right. political about it. It's getting on Facebook and saying, shoot, shovel, shut up, doesn't work. I, uh, we've seen that play out in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming. And, yeah. you know, Wyoming kind of took the cowboy stance on it and said, this is our state, we'll do it how we want. And it kind of backfired for a while there. It's, we've, we've, got to, we've got to get in the yeah. game. That's the only way to play the game is get in the game. And so get involved. Yeah. And as, as, as much as I think as a general rule, the hunting community is not real big on politics, not real big on litigation. I don't know what options are going to remain other than us upping our game and saying, you know what, let's hold our nose and play the same game they've played. And uh, as much as it's against our, our inherent nature, I think to get an outcome in Colorado that is uh, better for, for wildlife, uh, elk and deer, it's going to require engaging in those same strategies. You know, grab their playbook yep. and learn from it. And maybe I'm wrong, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy yeah, Thanksgiving, go, man. Corey. Well, uh, the good news is, is uh, it's getting me all fired up to go hunt wolves now. So I will, uh, I'll return and report <laughs> here. But we yeah. uh, we got a skip of snow last night, yeah. and that's what we've kind of been waiting for. So it's with a skip of snow, you can find yeah. fresh tracks. Yeah, I hope you go through that. That's uh, that might be my Thanksgiving weekend plans. Oh, cool! I hope you do it. I've got four yeah. tags left. I've got. I've got two for this yeah. year. I didn't buy any more. Just I figured two will be a tall build, a tall order to fill here. So we'll start there. Well, if anyone is in a state where you can uh, manage wolves by hunting and trapping, I hope you go out and do it. Um, I understand your frustration, uh, but like you said earlier, you know, ranting and raving and carrying on down at the bar or on Facebook isn't helping manage wolves. So. The more we do towards that effort, hopefully the more we get done, as hard of a of a yep. task as it is. So, what else Man, we got? I think uh, I'm, as you've been talking, I've been sitting here looking at all these different articles and everything on Colorado wolves, and it's 
It's just sad. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they ask people, what's the negative side? And the negative side is listed out. And it's pretty clear. There's a lot of negatives that would mm-hmm. come from having wolves in the state. The positive, yeah. you know, the, the, the positive comments that are being made are, well, bringing wolves back will have the same effect it did in Yellowstone where it revived the ecosystem. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> right. why we're doing yeah. it? That's, uh, did somebody sure. sit there and say, we need to revive the ecosystem in Colorado? What's the best way to do that? Well, let's bring wolves back. That's, that's not... That's what they're using as their positive argument, but that's not the motivation behind it. And that's the sad part is, you know, they're, they're being two-faced on that. And yeah. there's a reason they're being two-faced. There's a reason they're being deceptive. There's a reason for all of that. And it's, that's the scary part to me. Yeah. Well, on a brighter note, I'd like to leave the audience with a little elk hunting story. Excellent. <laughs> all right. So my uncle Larry, uh, he's 73. Last year, he had this tag in Wyoming, but he couldn't make it because he's been dealing with mental cell lymphoma for 12 years. He's been in two experimental chemo programs with MD Anderson Clinic in Houston. And last year in October, his doctor said, this chemo has messed up your heart so bad you are not going elk hunting. So he called me and he was bumming and... One of my friends had helped pass a bill in Wyoming that said if you have a limited entry tag that you can't use for health reasons, you can roll it forward one year if you fill out the paperwork, get the doctor's approval, and the, this board, there's some board that reviews everything and says yay or nay. So he gets the tag rolled forward to 2019. Uh Much to his doctor's predictions, this chemo really had messed up his heart. He ends up having a heart attack in April of this year. Uh, He's got neuropathy where he can't hardly feel his feet. He's got glaucoma that's taken 30 to 40% of his peripheral vision. Uh, The list goes on and on and on. Two weeks ago, he had a TIA, a mini stroke. And I'm supposed to take him out elk hunting and find an elk that he can shoot with the restrictions of he can't walk more than a mile, no steep grades. He can't carry anything. Do not let him have a knife because all these blood thinners he's on, he'll bleed to death. (laughs) (laughs) And he's such a great guy. His personality, he, he, uh, as I, I talked to him on the phone the day before he's getting ready to leave. He said, yeah, I'm in my prime now. Those (laughs) elk are in big trouble. Uh, just, he's such a, optimistic every day is a good guy kind good guy good day kind of guy so we find this group of elk that we think we can get them to there's 12 elk 12 bulls in one group there's one really nice bull i mean like really nice and the on this ridge that we're going to sneak across when we peek over there's eight of them to the right and four of them to the left but they're I, I look at them as though, okay, it's one group of 12 elk. And I tell Larry, now, when you peek over that rock, second one from the left. So he's got a 35-mile-an-hour wind blowing in his face. Peeks over the rock. Elk are out there at 270-some yards. He sees the group of eight straight out in front because with his glaucoma, he, he's lost his peripheral vision. He can't see the four off to the left that have the really big bull in it. Well, Larry made one a hell of a shot. I mean, he dropped that thing like it got hit by lightning. But unfortunately, it was the bull that was second from the left of the group of eight that were the ones over more to the right, not the one second to the left of the whole group. And uh, all of us were looking through our binoculars at the bull we knew we wanted him to shoot. And at the shot, that bull starts walking off, and I put another round in, shoot him. He's like, what do you mean? I, I, he fell. I said, no, he didn't. He's right there. He's walking away. Well, I look up over to the right, and there's a nice five-point bull <laughs> laying there, deader than disco. And, uh, <laughs> deader than disco. <laughs> I, I've heard a lot of your one-liners. Yeah. I have not heard deader <laughs> than disco. No. Oh really? Oh yeah. Disco, <laughs> disco's dead. It's. Uh, I guess you had to grow up in the seventies to uh, appreciate that term. But uh, 
So <clears throat> when Larry saw the big one walk over there on the hillside and look back at us, uh, and then he looks over and he sees that he, he made a fantastic shot on the one he killed. The amount of adult language, I don't know what we're <laughs> going to do with that footage, but anyone who's watched Uncle Larry in our past episodes, he, he, he had lost the traveling profanity trophy to a, a, a recently deceased friend of mine, a former Marine Corps guy, Bernie Coons. And, uh, but I think with that segment of about 10 minutes there while Larry was reconciling that he'd made a great shot, but it was on the wrong elk, he reclaimed the traveling profanity trophy during that that piece of footage. I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. <laughs> oh. But when it was all said and done, he was pretty excited because with all oh, the health yeah. issues he's had and and being 73 years old, and if you can imagine hunting elk in the mountains and not being able to feel your feet and having to look down to see where you're placed in every footstep, Man. that puts you at a serious yeah, disadvantage. And uh, but he pulled it off. I uh, I was so excited, Corey. It was probably. Uh, I don't. I, I haven't even looked at the footage to see what my response was. But of all the goals I might have had for my hunting this year, getting Uncle Larry a shot at a bull elk in Wyoming was the top goal, and he got it. And he made a great shot, even <laughs> if it was on the wrong bull. He made a great shot. And we spent the next day, me and the camera crew, packing his elk off the mountain. That's so, so cool. Very good that's day. That's a great day. Yeah. Hopefully that's a little more uplifting than <laughs> what we had drifted well, into. Well, I talking think about uh, in hopefully it, uh, it'll inspire people to get involved so that we can continue having those kind of experiences with our family and our children and the next generations because those are once-in-a-lifetime type experiences. Yeah, for sure. And I'd be remiss without asking people to do this. Go out to rmef.org, the Elk Foundation's website, and they have a tab that says where we do our conservation. And go to the Colorado tab. And, and I say that because RMEF has so many amazing volunteers and members in Colorado. And the amount of work, their money, their political advocacy, and their time has done to build these magnificent elk herds in Colorado is remarkable. And the Elk Foundation has done a ton of public access work in Colorado, and I could list tons of them, but I would just tell people go to that map at rmef.org, and you will see why the Elk Foundation and its members, its donors, and its volunteers feel so passionate about what's at stake in Colorado. And uh, I hope I hope the Colorado, well, I hope all Army of volunteers and donors continue to be as generous as they have been and that the Elk Foundation can continue to do great work in Colorado. And uh, I know they're going to be active in, in trying to get their members uh, involved in, in, well, they have been, and not just going forward, but they have been for the last year or two since this surfaced. Uh, Army F has been there <clears throat> doing what it can. Um, but the unfortunate part of the nonprofit laws are nonprofit groups like yeah. Army F can only do so much yeah, and just in to the add, political sphere. Just and to so, add to that a little bit, you know, we talk you. about what we can do to oppose it. Uh, the Elk Foundation is, is, you know, right there in that battle doing what they can to oppose wolves being introduced in Colorado. Uh, and I don't know this organization. I've not researched it all, but the, the organization Stop the Wolf Coalition is the collection of ranchers and sportsmen in Colorado who are opposing, kind of leading the organization to oppose that. Um, but just to give you an idea, and not to bring this all the way back negative to where we group pulled out of there, but just to tie it into the Elk Foundation and, and what they're doing and how we can kind of be involved there. There are very few organizations who are doing anything to fight it because it is so hard for a nonprofit to fight it. Um, but then you look on the on the the proponents of it, and it's so much easier for them to get involved. The nonprofits they've raised almost a million dollars to get it on the on the ballot basically and um there's a the tide center yeah. 
which is the San Francisco charity. They've donated over $260,000 to get it on the ballot. Defenders of Wildlife gave $100,000. Uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council Action Fund gave $50,000. And I've actually, I've, I've done podcasts with others in the past about books that I've read. I love reading books. I love, uh, you know, some of the self-help entrepreneurial type books. If you're familiar with Tim Ferriss, he wrote the book, The 4-Hour Workweek. He also has a podcast, really popular uh, author and podcaster. He donated $100,000 and challenged his podcast listeners to match that $100,000 to get the Wolf Initiative on the ballot in Colorado. Tim Ferriss. What was his name? So, the 4-Hour Workweek is a really mm. popular book that he wrote, and I've read it. and actually liked the book and some of the ideas there. But just just to give you an idea of what we have, what we're up against here, there's all these very wealthy, successful people who want wolves in Colorado who are donating hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then there's the hunting group that we're trying to beg people to give $35 to be a member of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We have to step up our efforts. We have to we have to get involved because we cannot yeah. stand up against the money that's being generated by people who think wolves belong there. And as sportsmen, we have a responsibility that we have to get involved and put our money where our mouth is, you know, and, and at least support these organizations who are trying to get signatures to oppose things, who are trying to rally voters when it happens. And it sounds like it's going to happen. So now our next fight is we've got to show up at the ballot boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully people will do that. Uh, you know, the, the day of just buying your license <laughs> and saying, I'm a conservationist, yep. those days are behind us. You know, it takes a lot more work, a lot more money, volunteerism, effort, all the above. And, uh, but we've kept them a long time, Corey. I was going to say, with um, that, I think I'm going to call it a work day, and I'm going to go out and look for wolf tracks this afternoon. <laughs> I hope you do that. And, it, and if you shoot one, bring the hindquarters and back straps, and we'll uh, have a comparative case test, the Idaho wolf compared to the Montana wolf. Yeah, it'll be a, a sample of one taste tester. You'll have to, <laughs> <laughs> you will be the voting party in that one. <laughs> Uh, I hope you find I hope you find their tracks and I hope the tracks lead you to putting your tag on one of them well I will keep you posted all right well folks thanks for listening appreciate it uh, hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving and uh, we'll catch them on the next pass sounds great thanks thanks Corey <laughs>